again for the uh, invitation to come back. I was here a few years ago and I always enjoy interacting with your group. Um, and I do appreciate there were actually some days of sunshine while I was here. So that was a nice to <laughs> support of that. I felt right at home. Um, so this is a program that I actually put together for our uh, uh, Angio Edema Center down at UC San Diego. And uh, it was accredited by our School of Medicine. Um, and, and in designing it, I really tried to tackle some of the things that I think are most challenging for us as specialists. Um, as you know, there have been lots of talks on HAE over the last decade. And uh, I think uh, the good news is hopefully it will capture interest because there have been a lot of changes and, and continue to be some evolution of this field. 
uh, over the last couple of years. In fact, I put this together about 12 months ago, and I can tell you I've had to update the slide set twice in the last 12 months because of how quickly things are moving. So hopefully it will be a little more than the usual, um, the usual topics, although we will, of course, review some of the basics. Um, so here's my disclosures. I do a lot of clinical research and consulting with uh, biopharmaceutical companies that are developing or have developed treatment in the space, um, uh, so be aware of that. All right, so we'll talk about HAE and how these patients present, which will be review for a lot of you. Um, I am going to cover uh, how we're trying to deal with uh, the HAE normal C1 inhibitor patients, which is probably the most frequent question that I and I'm sure some of you get from our colleagues and also from patients. Uh, and then the second half, I will talk about treatment. Um, uh, we'll review quickly some of the updated uh, evidence-based guidelines that have come out, and I'll show you a little bit on what's new uh, in HAE therapies. So this, I'll go through this first section quickly. This is review for this group, but one of the things we always want to be sure of when we evaluate patients is, is their swelling consistent with angioedema? And uh, like you, I get lots of patients that come for lots of different reasons uh, why they're swelling. So I like photographs. Uh, they used to be difficult to get photographs. Now there's no excuse not to have a picture if, if you're having recurrent swelling. Um, and the other point is, of course, that this is an episodic condition. So I saw a woman a few months ago, a lovely 80-year-old woman brought in by her family. And uh, you could see from across the room her, stung, her tongue sticking out of her mouth. Uh, and I was actually a little worried about her airway, but she seemed to be comfortable. So I asked her daughter, I said, how long has her tongue been like this huge sticking out of her mouth? And she said, about eight months. And I said, uh, well, this is the angioedema clinic, and that ain't angioedema. Uh, uh, she unfortunately ended up, we got her to ENT, tongue biopsy, she had amyloid, and she ended up having uh, lymphoproliferative disease, um, for which, unfortunately, she passed away from uh, during, while getting treated. But... Uh, at any rate, um, angioedema, as you know, comes and goes. Depending on the pathway, it may last for a few hours or it may last for several days, um, but things go back to normal after the, uh, the swelling event. The other challenges that, that at least I face are people who come in with isolated airway symptoms, feeling that their throat is closing or that they're choking. Uh, many of these people go online and think, I must have angioedema because I know that can cut off the airway from swelling. And... Just a reminder, these are things that commonly come through our clinic build as, quote, angioedema, vocal cord dysfunction. I've had a few patients over the years that had floppy airways from tracheomalacia. Uh, unfortunately, in some cases, because they've been repeatedly intubated because of this concern of airway swelling, and so almost an iatrogenic problem. Uh, and then I've had a couple patients that self-diagnosed with exercise-induced angioedema when, of course, they had asthma. And so um, we sort of have to keep our mind open to the possibilities the other um, issue at our joint, at least, is recurrent abdominal pain. I, I never intended to, nor am I uh, an expert in, uh, in abdominal pain, but people you know, will read online that you can get GI abdominal pain, uh, and that as an isolated symptom of angioedema is, of course, very unusual um, if they don't have cutaneous swelling. So um, we've diagnosed people with these other much more common uh, GI issues, and then, of course, get them to the proper specialist. So uh, these are a couple of folks with angioedema. You can see the, the young guy at the top actually has hives as well, which is, we know, an important clue to the mechanism. Uh, this is a woman with hereditary angioedema. But just a reminder, this is generally not non-pitting, localized. It involves the, the sub-Q or the submucosal membranes. Um, and it uh, is a leak problem. That's how I explain it to patients. This is fluid leaking out of the capillaries uh, into the dermis and sub tissues or submucosal tissues where it shouldn't be. And as we've discussed, uh, it's episodic, uh, typically asymmetrical, and is not the, uh, as you know, the bilateral lower extremity swelling that occurs throughout the day. Um, we, we, I get a referral for that every once in a while also. And this is the differential that we are familiar with and we run down um, up to about here. Uh, and up, these tend to be, of course, the mast cell mediated or histaminergic conditions. Uh, from ACE inhibitor down here, these are believed to be bradykinin mediated in most cases, with the exception of the idiopathic category, which is uh, clearly split between uh, mast cell mediated and likely bradykinin induced, although, of course, we call this 
non-histaminergic a lot of the time because we haven't proven uh, that all of these cases are truly bradykinin. Uh, and in terms of um, getting to the bottom of this, I always emphasize to the residents and fellows, taking the history is the most valuable thing you can do because um, we're looking for clues as to triggers or exposures. We always review the medication list to exclude the familiar causes of, of angioedema there. There are some physical um, causes uh, along with urticaria. I have a couple patients that have very clear cold-induced angioedema. They actually don't get hives. They just get very large um, uh, subcutaneous uh, regions of swelling. So we can see physical forms of this. Uh, and then this is, this is not to suggest that we should be sending all these labs in people that have angioedema, but again, guided by the history. Is there, uh, are there evidence of any other systemic causes that we would um, need to send uh, labs to rule out those as, a, as an underlying issue related to angioedema? So um, the history is, is incredibly important um, and uh, that's in part due to the limitations we have for many uh, of, uh, in terms of laboratory studies that will help us. Just a reminder, when we look at uh, HAE due to C1 inhibitor deficiency, 75% uh, of those patients will have a clear family history, uh, but 25% won't, and so we always ask about it, but it's not required to have a family history uh, in order to be suspicious of uh, HAE. All right, this is a very practical slide. It's probably slightly oversimplified, but I, I think in clinical practice, this is actually where we spend most of our effort is to determine, do we think a person has a mast cell or histamine-mediated problem uh, caused by these uh, mediators uh, released from mast cells, or do we think it's non-histaminergic or kinin-related? And that's how I think when I see a patient. My, my first goal is to try to decide, do I think it's in the bucket on the left or the bucket on the right? Uh, because that helps guide the testing and then also the initial treatment plan that we set up for the patient. And as you know, one of the best clues is do they have hives or itching? Um, we know that occurs in about 90% of people with uh, mast cell related issues, though there are these exceptions that just have a pure isolated angioedema and those, those can be some of the more challenging people that we see. If they don't have the itching or, or, or hives, then we at least have to raise our suspicion for a kinin-related or a non-histaminergic problem. Uh, and these are just two uh, uh, patients. This guy has a shrimp allergy and uh, his face is swollen, and this woman has HAE and her face is swollen. So uh, while you know there may be some subtle clues, you can't necessarily tell by looking at photos which um, type of swelling uh, people have. Well, I Photos are helpful. You almost never see anybody with histamine disease look like the woman. This one. This one here. Yeah. I mean, that, that degree of lift angioedema is very characteristic of this disease. Or would you say otherwise? I, I, no, I, I agree with you in general, although I do have some histamine mediated patients, maybe not the entire, not both lips like this, but they'll get an upper lip that's very swollen um, or an asymmetrical lip swelling that's actually very impressive. Um, so, uh, but I agree, I'm not sure I've ever seen a histamine-mediated patient that look quite like this with this degree of, you know, voluminous swelling. Uh, all right, and this is just a table, you've, you've seen this a million times, but th this is important, and I always, again, with our fellows, I say, did you ask these questions? Because these are our, often our best clues as to where we should be concentrating. Um, Mast cell uh, angioedema tends to be more rapid in onset and also more rapid in resolution. So this takes, people will tell you, my, my lip swells up in you know, 30 minutes, it's, it's huge, and it's gone within you know, less than 24 hours. Well, that's probably a histaminergic or mast cell problem versus the bradykinin form, which has typically a slower onset, takes several hours for people to really um, uh, get swollen and typically lasts for a few days before it will spontaneously resolve. Uh, the, the hives, the itching are good clues, and then um, response to therapy. And we'll talk a little bit more about this because um, there's a lot of debate about you know, how hard do you push before you say this is really a non-histaminergic problem. Um, we've typically borrowed from the urticaria literature and said uh, if you put people on four times the labeled dose of a non-sedating antihistamine, you should see some signal, some improvement uh, preventatively if it's a, a mast cell mediated problem. But you know, and anyone could point out that, well, not all people with chronic urticaria respond well to those agents. So 
do we need to be using, you know, omalizumab or montelukast or even corticosteroids in the, to determine the response? That, that's something that's uh, hotly debated at the moment. But at any rate, asking the patient, if you've got these agents, antihistamines, corticosteroids, even epinephrine in the emergency department, did you get better? And patients are pretty reliably accurate about that. Yeah, I was, I was out of there, you know, in six hours after I got that. Or, no, nah, I got that, they sent me home, but I was still exactly the same for three days. That's an important um, clinical feature to ask about. I, I think we're good at that, but as you know, there's patients that bounce around from doctor to doctor or hospital to hospital where no one really pays attention to the fact that they may not be responding to that uh, cocktail that they get in the emergency department on a regular basis. All right, this is data from Marco Giacardi's group in Italy, and I show it because it's the largest collection of, uh, of data that we have for patients that have angioedema without urticaria, and that's really what we're, we're focused on now because if they have hives, we sort of put them in this group that's likely to be histaminergic. Uh, you know, we were just talking uh, before the program, yes, there are people that have angioedema, and oh, by the way, they have chronic hives, and maybe those are two different um, conditions. There are a few patients out there like that, and they're really confusing to manage. But most of the time, if you see hives, we, we can be treating them pretty effectively with the, uh, the, the same medications we use for chronic urticaria. This group only has uh, angioedema without urticaria, and what I want to point out is a couple of things. Um, if you're looking for a cause, a trigger, an allergen, you only find that in their data in about 16%. The most common uh, diagnosis after a fairly exhaustive evaluation is, no surprise to, to this group, idiopathic. Um, and so that's uh, pretty frustrating for us and, and very frustrating for patients. Um, if you look at that idiopathic group, though, about 80 to 85 percent of them are histaminergic, meaning if you put them on enough antihistamines um, or uh, add montelukast, um, you will see a response uh, uh, and be able to prevent or reduce the, the frequency of those attacks. There is a group of uh, idiopathic patients that are non-histaminergic. It's, again, only about 15 to 20 percent, but those people exist. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, that group. Um, and then you get into C1 inhibitor deficiency, which we'll talk about. Like, this is a referral center, so this number is probably a bit higher than it would be uh, out in the general population, and ACE inhibitor-induced uh, angioedema, which hopefully we all recognize uh, and catch. And he's updated the numbers since then. Now he's well over 1,000 patients. Uh, this this uh, table is a little bit different, but the numbers really don't change that much in terms of the underlying cause. So the point being that if you uh, take a good history, uh, most of the time you're going to find people that have idiopathic angioedema. Um, most of them will be histaminergic in nature. Um, and then, of course, we can't forget about HAE um, and ACE-induced angioedema. If you sort of uh, work through those categories, you'll cover about 90% of what causes uh, isolated angioedema um, uh, in terms of uh, diagnosing and then treating the patient. All right, I won't belabor this. This is, again, a review of the basics, but just realize that when we work up patients with uh, angioedema and no hives, we have to consider sending complement testing, uh, and uh, the C1 inhibitor level and function are going to identify patients that have type 1 or type 2 HAE, the C4 will generally be low in those patients, even at baseline. Uh, that's been shown to be true about 85 to 90 percent of the time. So C4 is not a perfect screening test in an asymptomatic patient, but it's, it's very, very good. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about HAE with normal C1 inhibitor. Um, and then I'm not going to spend much time at all on acquired C1 inhibitor deficiency, but just remember to keep this in mind for that patient that has their first swelling event over the age of 40. Um, if you identify C1 inhibitor deficiency. I just saw a woman last week, uh, she came in to see me for a second opinion. She was told by her local allergist uh, that she had uh, HAE. She did have C1 inhibitor deficiency, but she had a first swelling attack at age 67. That would be extraordinarily unusual for a patient with HAE. And unfortunately, I had to call her yesterday and tell her, yes, you have monoclonal B cells in your, in your plasma or in your, in your blood, and we have to get you to a hematologist because there's something underlying this as a consumptive process. So these are just um, the labs that, that we want to be sending. 
All right, this is Mike Frank's data of back when he was at the NIH, and he was one of the first to establish that the C4 level is good, but not perfect. So you can see there's lots of people with HAE with C1 inhibitor deficiency that have um, low C4 levels. Here's a whole group where it's almost undetectable down here. But in the asymptomatic patient, there are these few outliers that have normal levels. And uh, repeat studies now have shown that group to be about uh, 10 to 15 percent. So um, a good screening test, but not perfect. This is another testing nuance that I think as specialists we should be aware of. Um, this is uh, the two C1 inhibitor functional assays that are available in the United States. On the top is the chromogenic assay. This is not widely available on a commercial basis. Uh, there are a couple of labs in Denver, Colorado that do this test, including the National Jewish Complement Laboratory. Um, but if you send uh, routine C1 inhibitor testing to any of the big commercial labs, you will get this test on the bottom, which is a complex ELISA assay called the Quidel assay. The only reason I bring this up is that you can see that there are some differences in the sensitivity of these assays. Um, this test that we typically get when you send to the commercial labs does occasionally have some sensitivity problems. It's related to where they um, draw the normal reference value. And if you use the off-kit, or sorry, the, 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 the kit-based uh, reference value, it draws the normal level here. It calls this level between 60 and uh, about 78 an equivocal um, level. And it will categorize some patients that have true C1 inhibitor deficiency as either normal or equivocal. Um, so this, this doesn't happen that often. I'll show you the data. But... Uh, there are patients, I've seen a few over the last couple of years, that get misdiagnosed or actually missed entirely because this, there's sensitivity problems with this particular assay. The chromogenic assay generally draws a very nice delineation between those that have C1 inhibitor deficiency and those that are normal. So my point here is not, not that you have to send the chromogenic assay on every patient, but if you are suspicious, uh, you have a very good history um, uh, of uh, C C1 inhibitor deficiency or HAE, uh, and or the labs don't quite make sense, meaning you, maybe you have a, a C4 level that's low, but this function looks equivocal or normal, um, it is worth on occasion um, trying to get this lab done just because it's a, it's a more sensitive and I think reliable way to diagnose C1 inhibitor deficiency. Are you doing it in San Diego? You also so, uh, that's a complicated question. <laughs> the answer is yes, we are doing it. We do it all the time in the research laboratory. It's not a difficult assay. We don't have our CLIA certification at the moment. We've been working on that for the last uh, almost two years now. The university, of course, is uh, moves at the pace of a snail. And so um, we hope that not too long from now, you could send this to us and we could do it for clinical use. Um, uh, but at the moment, we can't, uh, we can't technically use it for clinical uh, management because we don't have the certification yet. And to your point, Lynn, the, the problem with the chromogenic assay is that it's not easy to get. Um, I, I've talked to a lot of people who, you know, National Jewish has a complicated billing system and it's sort of a hassle to send it there. So um, it does take some effort at the moment to get this, this assay done. Um, we routinely right now send to Denver because we have a lot of patients and we have a high volume, but um, but on a one-off basis, it's a little bit of a hassle. Is there a way to mess up on the sample when you send it and get a false false uh, negative? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, and this is the one assay that is actually fairly sensitive to handling. So the C4, stable and pretty easy to do. The C1 antigenic test, hard to screw that up. This test, the either functional test actually, if you draw the blood and sit it on the counter for four hours, you will actually start to get a false low, falsely low level. So you can actually over-diagnose people if it's not handled properly. These samples should be spun within an hour and then um, basically frozen or at least the very least refrigerated um, and sent to the laboratory in a timely fashion. So. The other, to your point, Art, the other, the other thing that I see not uncommonly is I see people that come in with not a very good story for HAE um, clinically. Uh, they have a normal C4, they have a normal antigenic level, and then they've got a, a, a functional level that's low. And so when we repeat the test and it's handled properly, everything is normal. So you can get actually over-diagnosed people because 
the sample is not handled promptly or, or it gets too warm during the handling. This is a study we did a few years ago at several sites in the country. We had 31 patients that we knew had C1 inhibitor deficiency due to repeat testing and also um, genotyping um, uh, sequencing. And what I just want to point out is that we ran in parallel these two tests, uh, and you can see 71% of the time you got the same results in the C1 inhibitor function. Um, but in 23%, you had low levels on the chromogenic assay, which again, is really the gold standard, and the commercial ELISA gave this equivocal result. And if you read the package labeling on the ELISA, it says, if you get a uh, an equivocal result, resend the test which I've done on, on a number of occasions. You know what you get if you resend the test? So equivocal. <laughs> so you can go around and circle over and over again. Um, so you get this equivocal result 23% of the time, and then this is what is, was a little bit alarming. In 6%, only two patients, but in these two patients, you got a completely normal result on the ELISA where the chromogenic was clearly low. So again, it's not gonna happen very often. What I usually tell people is if you get an equivocal result, which does happen not infrequently, it, be suspicious, you know, at least talk to that patient again and perhaps think about either retesting or trying to send the chromogenic assay um, because that's the group I think that we could be missing. Yes? Do you find that it, it makes a difference where in the attack it occurs, like if they're in resolution versus onset of the attack? Does that change the outcome much? Um, it, it shouldn't, and there's not a lot of evidence that it does. There, there are very rare case reports of people having sort of normalish levels and then it drops, the function drops low during an attack, but those would be really exceptional. It, it shouldn't matter when you do the test. Yeah. Do you have a question also? No? Okay. Um, so just, just be aware of those nuances because it, that, these are the referrals we get, right? And the labs don't add up and this, this could be a reason for that. And then this is just the data in another way. So the, the chromogenic test uh, in, in our hands and in the European uh, uh, study that was similarly done um, has a, a good sensitivity and specificity if it's handled properly. Uh, the ELISA that the big labs do is not quite as impressive. Um, uh, you can see the sensitivity here was 73%, although it was very specific. And in our hands, that C4 level that we use at screening was 86% uh, sensitivity, so right in that 10 to 15% range in, in asymptomatic uh, individuals. All right, um, the sequencing, uh, of course, you can get sequencing commercially done for the C1 inhibitor gene. Uh, we don't do it very often in clinical practice because the biochemical tests are usually sufficient. Um, but we're up over 500 different mutations that cause C1 inhibitor deficiency. Um, they come in a variety of uh, flavors, uh, missense, uh, deletions, uh, and so forth. Um, exon 8 is, uh, for those of you that may have to take the boards um, in the near future, exon 8 is worth knowing because that's where most of the type 2 causative mutations occur, um, patients that have normal levels but abnormal function. So that, that could show up on your, your board exam. And this is, um, you can't see the, the corner here, but this is a, a dirty little secret in, in HAE is that um, at least previous studies have shown that 10% of people who clearly have C1 inhibitor deficiency have no identifiable serpent G1 mutation. Now, we, I think, personally, that a lot of this is due to the quality of previous sequencing, that as we get um, better coverage and deeper sequencing, that we are actually finding these people have mutations that weren't identified before. But it, it's still possible that there's some other, you know, off-site uh, cause of C1 inhibitor deficiency in a few people. And so, um, as, as we all know, sequencing isn't perfect all the time in terms of giving us an answer. This, this perplexes me. Basically, why does disease persist in humankind? Because you only have to inherit one bad gene. I don't know of any biologic advantage to having this. And you got about 300 different site mutations you would think this would have extinguished itself yeah. in, in humans. Do you have any answer to that? I, I don't. It, it's a hot spot, right, for yeah. mutations. And I had a, one of my mentors uh, back at UCLA loved this. He really loved to try to figure out what's the evolutionary advantage to genes like this that have all these different uh, mutations. Um, I, I don't know of any advantage, and I have never heard anybody um, hypothesize what it might be. So to your point, I'm not sure why this is occurring, but uh, 
every year, you know, another dozen or two new mutations have been described, and so it just keeps, like everything in genetics, keeps sort of expanding. Are these all on the same chromosome? Uh, it's chromosome 11. It, yeah, it's all, so all the, these mutations yeah. are chromosome 11. Yeah. And are there different ethnic uh, do people of Asian versus Northern European segregate between these groups? It's a good question. Not that I know of, um, but I have to admit I haven't looked closely to see if there, you know, if there's certain mutations that are um, correlated or associated with certain ethnic backgrounds. Because you see the data with, like, the European population will have, I don't know, more urticaria, lack of urticaria. It's just confusing in that regard. Yeah, and it's quite possible, when we're going to talk, actually, the next slide is a nice transition, the factor 12 mutation, th this clearly does, there seems to be a founder effect that you see, you see this much more commonly in Western Europe, so uh, Spain, Germany, Portugal, France, and in our U.S. population, we, we're we not finding these people nearly that prevalent, so we think we're testing the same people in terms of symptoms. Um, so I put this up uh, basically mainly because it's a nice piece of science and it's a pretty slide, but this is uh, the factor 12 mutation. And as, if you follow the literature, you know, this was um, thought to explain a lot of the HAE normal C1 inhibitor patients that have been described in the literature. And in Europe, it has been found in about 25 to 30 percent of that population that have these typical symptoms of bradykinin mediated angioedema, a clear family pedigree that you can trace it down in an autosomal dominant fashion. And there were two main um, uh, mutations that have been described, which are listed here at the top of the slide. Um, this is a mouse model that really clinched that this is a bradykinin mediated condition. And uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, immunofluorescence looking at the vasculature. And you can, if you activate the contact system with dextran sulfate in these mice, you can sort of track the leakage um, uh, of their vessels. So here's a wild type mouse. Here's a C1 inhibitor deficiency uh, or, or knockout mouse, so typical of type 1 and type 2, where you get this dramatic leak within 10 to 20 minutes. Um, this is a factor 12 knockout mouse. So if you remove factor 12, and, and we'll look at the contact pathway in a moment, but you aren't able to activate calocrine and turn on bradykinin production, so you don't see leak here. These are the two factor 12 uh, mutation knock-in mice. So you put in this mutation that's been uh, described in these human families that causes or is associated with HAD, and again, you activate with dextran sulfate, you see this leakage that really approximates C1 inhibitor deficiency. Uh, and then if you knock back in normal factor 12, you basically can turn off that leak. So this was, uh, this along with some other experiments really showed this is a contact system problem, excessive bradykinin due to the activation of, of uh, the, the, the contact system. Um, now, in uh, the U.S., like I said, we've tested a lot of people over the last five years for the factor 12 mutation, and I can count on one hand, in fact, I can count on three fingers the number of people that we've found. So our hit rate is um, less than 5%, um, and we're talking to the people at National Jewish that have done a lot of this sequencing, it's the same story there of all the samples they're getting from across the country. Less than 5% are positive for one of these mutations. Are we testing the right people? Well, I think we are at our center. I can't speak for the rest of the country. Um, but but we're, this has been disappointing, I would say, from a diagnostic standpoint. We're just not seeing the prevalence that was described in the European literature. So um, to, to hold uh, on that thought for a moment, this is, of course, the problem that a lot of us cope with are these people that we think have a form of hereditary angioedema but have normal complement labs. And, I'm going to erase the type 3. Well, actually, this slide said I didn't erase it. We're not calling it type 3 anymore if we can keep from it. I know it's easier to say. Um, but uh, the problem is, as I'll show you, this group of patients is now splitting into different subpopulations. It's not just one type. Um, and that's why we don't like the type 3 name. Um, a few years ago, in fact, six years ago now, uh, a, a group of people got together and we tried to put some clinical criteria on this condition because we were struggling with, with sort of deciding who has this and who doesn't. These are the clinical criteria that were put into a publication, um, and, and I will admit these have problems with them. Uh, we've got to do better and we're working on that, but the definition that we've been using is this recurrent angioedema in the absence of hives or uh, medication that would cause the angioedema, normal complement labs, 
And then one of the following, so either this factor 12 mutation that I just told you really we aren't seeing much in the US, um, or a positive family history and documented evidence of resistance to chronic high dose antihistamine therapy. So that last criteria has got a lot of problems with it. Number one, the family history. The literature, of course, shows these pedigrees where you can march down the symptomatic patients right through the generations. My experience with the family history is um, the old saying, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess, right? If you, <laughs> if you ask somebody enough times, does anybody in your family have angioedema, they will invariably come up with somebody who swelled at some point. Um, so that, that, I think, is a very insensitive and non-specific you know, non uh, criteria. And then the other issue is this resistance to, to high dose antihistamine therapy. So again, we sort of borrow from the chronic arterial literature, but uh, as I mentioned before, we know that there are hives patients that don't really respond very well to that, uh, that, that single therapy. And so we've had a lot of debate over the last year or two, you know, should we be adding uh, Montelukast? Should we be adding omalizumab? Should we be adding a trial of steroids at least acutely to see what the response is? So uh, we're not happy with this, but this is what has been published so far, and uh, I think you're going to see some revisions to this in, in the not too distant future. Um, th so you know, this is the, the old saying: we don't even know what to be afraid of with uh, with these patients because we really don't understand the mechanism. I will tell you, there's some work going on um, uh, for biomarkers of these uh, for the, in these patients to help guide what we're doing. Um, the top three are really biochemical markers that have, have been published, and none of these are commercially available yet, but we, we're hopeful that they may be in the not-too-distant future. The top is Alan Kaplan's group, um, where he's actually looked at the function of C1 inhibitor not to inhibit C1 or bind C1, because remember, that's what we're measuring when we send it to the lab, its ability to bind, or in the, in the case of chromogenic assay, to, to inhibit the proteolytic activity of C1, complement C1. And that has nothing to do with why people swell, right? So we're, we're actually measuring a surrogate marker for, for C1 inhibitor function. What Alan's done is he's looked at C1 inhibitor's ability to, to inhibit, bind and inhibit calocrine activity or factor 12A activity, which are the causative, we believe, the, the causative components in the contact pathway. And he's shown that, that his assay is a little bit more sensitive uh, than the C1 assays, but what's really interesting, he hasn't published this yet, but he's stated it publicly at meetings, so I can tell you, um, he's found some, quote, normal C1 inhibitor patients that actually don't normally inhibit calocrine or factor 12A. So it's possible that in a small group of patients, we've been measuring the wrong inhibitory capacity all along, um, and so he's, he needs to replicate that in a larger group, but it's possible that actually would give us a different answer in certain patients than, than the ones we're doing now. The second title there is, is our group in San Diego. We published this a, a few months ago, and this is actually a threshold-stimulated calocrine activity assay. So we were able to show that in uh, a group of histaminergic angioedema patients and normal controls, um, that their calocrine activity is different compared to known bradykinin-mediated uh, patients when you add dextran sulfate to their plasma and measure the activity of their calocrine. So another way of saying that is people with bradykinin-mediated conditions may have a much more easily activated calocrine system than those uh, that don't have these conditions. Um, and we had a very nice sensitivity and specificity on the ROC um, such that we hope to, that that might be something commercially useful. So I was telling Len this is all in the patent process at the university and it's taking a lot longer than, we, than it should. But that, that's an easily done assay. It doesn't require a lot of special handling and so it could actually be clinically useful. And then the third one is a clevekininogen assay. Um, uh, as you probably know, bradykinin is incredibly difficult to measure. It's technically difficult to measure in blood samples. Um, you can measure much more easily clevekininogen as a fragment and again as a, a surrogate marker of bradykinin production. So there is an amino assay that this group in uh, the Netherlands has developed, uh, again not commercially available, but might be a way to look for excessive bradykinin and give us a clue what the, the mechanism is in these idiopathic patients. And then these two genes are the latest in genetics of, of angioedema, so angiopoietin-1 and plasminogen. 
Um, they've been described in Europe. The plasminogen one on the bottom has been described now in 60 patients in Germany, as well as some families in Japan and France. Um, so this may actually end up being somewhat common in these, uh, quote, idiopathic patients. Um, you can't get that yet in the United States. You can't get either of these commercially done. But again, um, we're looking to potentially set up a targeted gene panel that, that would give us the opportunity to test for these things in our patients where we don't know the cause of their swelling. So I like to say, you know, it's, it's good to be a nice doctor, but it's better to be a good doctor and, and try to get the, 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 uh, the right diagnosis for our patients. All right, um, let's quickly shift to something we know a little bit more about, which is C1 inhibitor deficiency. I won't belabor these slides. You know, you know the symptoms of, of HAE with the recurrent swelling. Um, that's due to either low levels or low function of, of the C1 esterase inhibitor protein. Um, and these are the patients that you take care of uh, that have cutaneous swelling, uh, gastrointestinal swelling, uh, and then a subset of them, of course, will have airway involvement uh, that we know has a very high mortality rate if it's not <coughs> recognized and treated. And Conrad Borg established some years ago that, that it's up to 40% mortality in, in patients uh, that are not treated appropriately. Um, those were mostly patients that actually weren't even diagnosed. So that's, I always tell people, if you make the diagnosis of HAE, you dramatically drop their uh, risk of dying from about 40% down to less than 5%, because that, that's what Borg showed. If you get the diagnosis, that's the result, uh, in improved mortality. We talked about these are more protracted attacks typically. Uh, they often last uh, somewhere between two and five days if they're not treated and they're unresponsive, of course, to allergy medicines. Um, the variability is something that, that is challenging because every patient uh, is different and they maybe have different frequency and severity over the course of their lifetime that, that's very unpredictable. Estrogen makes this worse, so we try to avoid estrogen use in women with HAE, um, and there are triggers including trauma and uh, psychological or physical stress for a lot of patients. Uh, and don't forget, this is autosomal dominant. So if you have a patient, it's good to encourage their first degree relatives to be tested. And we did a study a few years ago that shows we're actually pretty poor at this, um, meaning that a lot of patients that have not had family testing done despite the fact that we know this is an autosomal dominant disorder. Just a review of the pathway, the contact system. Um, so uh, the red dots are where C1 inhibitor has important inhibitory functions. and the most important are uh, likely to be uh, its inhibition of calocrine here and its inhibition of factor 12A uh, in these um, places. Um, Complement, of course, has nothing to do with why people swell, but we use it diagnostically because if you lack C1 inhibitor, you'll typically drop your C4 level uh, in, in most patients. And so this is a bradykinin-mediated condition. Now, when we talk about therapies, um, all of the drugs we have are predicated on this understanding of the contact system. Um, and I'm not going to cover all of these in detail. We've had many of these for years now, including androgens, icatabans, uh, icalantide. We have seen some new developments in the uh, use of C1 inhibitor protein, as well as the development of the monoclonal antibody lanadelumab. So I'll show you a, a little bit of data on those uh, treatments. Do we know why androgens work? Um, not really. Uh, it's probably a combination effect. Um, there, there's a little bit of data, although it's not that convincing, that it does increase C1 inhibitor levels. Um, uh, and there also is uh, the, the more recent data, although it's not that new now, is that it also um, accelerates the degradation of bradykinin. So it may be that you increase the C1 inhibitor a bit and you also break down bradykinin more rapidly. And, and it's probably a multifactorial. Because Mike Frank's data from decades ago was incredible as to how well it worked. They do work. I mean, yeah. there, there's little question about the efficacy, but in terms of the mechanism, I don't think that's ever been really worked out very well. It, it's, an, it's, it's an interesting story, and Mike probably told you this, um, how androgens were discovered, their efficacy in HAE. And so Mike, I think it was when he was at the NIH, yeah. and was working in a, a corridor with a various scientists, and there was a trial of androgens somewhere down the hall looking at it as a, a birth control, as a contraceptive. 
And um, it turned out it was a terrible contraceptive. Um, but uh, the science, lead scientist came down to Mike, knowing he was interested in the compliment, and said, you know, it's really interesting. I had this patient that enrolled in the study, a woman, uh, and uh, she has this uh, C1 inhibitor deficiency. And she told me, well, um, it's really strange. I didn't have a single attack while I was on the trial, and I used to have a lot of attacks. And so that's actually how they started to look at the efficacy of of uh, antigens and HAE, totally serendipitous. Yeah, pure science. Um, are a certain percentage of, of people, at least in the viral pharma study, got worse than C1 INH. And do you have any idea why? I'm going to show you a little bit of that data. I mean, I, I think it's a dose effect, honestly. I, I think the dose was uh, was too low, and there were other reasons. There were other confounders in this couple of patients, other things that were happening outside of the study. Uh, but I, I am going to touch on that because that's always been a, a bit of a question. Um, you guys know this, but there are guidelines out there. In fact, there's lots of guidelines. Um, the, the one I'm going to show you quickly is the WAO guideline because it's the most recently updated. The Canadian guidelines are being revised in uh, actually next week um, in Toronto. And the US HAEA guidelines are in Bruce Zura's hands right now. We've written them rewritten them and uh, are waiting for him to submit them. So hopefully it will be a new version of those coming out in the next uh, few months. Um, the, all the guidelines talk about these strategies, so treating attacks when they occur, um, short-term uh, prophylaxis and long-term prophylaxis. Um, short-term prophylaxis is probably the least utilized of these approaches, but it is important when we have patients that are going to have uh, dental surgery, uh, any uh, general anesthesia, manipulation of their bowel with various procedures. Um, and we have some options um, as to how to manage those people in the short term. I just want to show you this because this is the best data we have. We actually don't have controlled trials of short-term prophylaxis. But this is a European group that looked at 137 patients retrospectively. Um, that were undergoing surgical interventions. Most of these were surgical procedures. There was some oral uh, surgery mixed in here. But you can see if they didn't do anything, you, you didn't give short-term prophylaxis, about 44% of the patients had an angioedema complication. If you did give them some form of short-term prophylaxis, you could get that down to about 10%. Now, this was a mixed group. They used androgens and they used C1 inhibitor infusions uh, based on, again, retrospective, based on the local management. What they were able to show is that the C1 inhibitor concentrate gave a better result statistically in terms of prevention compared to androgens. So it's not wrong to use androgens, you know, starting a week ahead of time, but more and more we're trying to give C1 inhibitor infusions prior to procedures just because the best data we have shows that that's superior in terms of uh, preventative effects. Treatment of acute attacks. So these are what the guidelines say. All patients should have an acute therapy, and we have these options in the, in the U.S., uh, the two C1 inhibitor products, plasma-derived or recombinant, the calentide or acatabans. The guidelines state patients should have at least two doses, um, and that's because of data showing that about 10% of patients will need a second dose to terminate their attack, regardless of which medicine you use. Um, and then early treatment, which also relates to the emphasis now on self-administration you see here. Numerous studies now showing the earlier you treat an attack, the better people do. They have less severe swelling and a shorter time uh, to their full recovery. So we really emphasize people treating early on. All attacks are eligible for treatment and then hospital evaluation for laryngeal involvement. And I've learned to become a negotiator with this last point because with acute therapy being effective, a lot of patients will say, well, I don't need to go to the hospital. I know my medicine's gonna work fine. Sadly, we still see rare deaths from HAE, and it's typically because people sit at home too long with a laryngeal attack. These medicines can take a few hours to work sometimes, um, and so depending on when the medicine is given, you, you may not entirely reduce the risk so no one wants to go to the hospital, no one wants to check in. I tell them, okay, you don't have to check in at the triage desk, but go sit in the parking lot, if nothing else, so that you're right there. Go to the Starbucks, or heck, even go to the bar right next to the hospital for all I care, but be close to the hospital. Conrad Bork did some work showing that by the time you have difficulty breathing from an HAE attack, you may have about 10 to 15 minutes before you actually lose consciousness. So. Waiting until you have trouble breathing is a really bad idea um, with, with HAE. 
Uh, I'm not going to belabor this. I think you have the slides, right? So these tables are in the slides. This is, again, just to compare and contrast the acute treatments we have approved by the FDA. Uh, these two are sub-Q. These two are intravenous. Um, they all have their potential risks and disadvantages. Um, but all of these, uh, except for acalantide, are approved for self-administration. So uh, over the years, we've really encouraged people, even if they respond well to an IV medicine, to learn how to do self-infusion, and it's been remarkably effective. I've actually been really impressed um, with how many people can successfully do uh, a butterfly needle and do an IV infusion if, if that's the treatment that they want to use. Um, so uh, at any rate, be aware of these. These are important to walk people through their options uh, when, we're, when we're discussing acute treatment with them. And I've talked about this. This is the home administration data. M multiple studies, you can see the references showing the, the benefit and the quality of life improvements with self-treatment of these attacks, uh, even with IV medicines. And so we, we do this, I think, routinely, but we have to be aware of the different medicines. Uh, we have choices and we have to choose wisely, but also listening to our patients in terms of what's going to work uh, best for them when selecting a treatment plan. Um, let me talk quickly about uh, prevention. And when we talk about prevention, I always like to include the non-pharmacologic prevention, which includes uh, counseling patients on trigger factors. You see them listed here. So of course, trauma, uh, infection, which may be unavoidable, uh, avoiding ACE inhibitors and estrogens. And then the, the big mystery over the years has been uh, stress. So the old moniker of angioneurotic edema and the, the recognition that psychological stress can cause problems. We actually have some science behind this now, which is pretty cool. This is, again, Alan Kaplan's group, and he used, an endothelial cells, uh, used endothelial cells to study the effects of cytokines and estradiol on the expression of heat shock proteins. And you can see you get these very nice dose-dependent uh, um, production of heat shock protein 90 with IL-1 or tumor necrosis factor or estradiol. The importance of that is then he took this same uh, endothelial cell model and showed that if you expose uh, these cells, uh, if you put now into the system uh, uh, pre-calocrine and high molecular weight kininogen, you can actually turn on the production of bradykinin. This is the pathway of activation of bradykinin with uh, IL-1 here, tumor necrosis alpha here, uh, and um, estradiol. So, in fact, under stress, either infection or other physical or mental stressors that lead to cytokines uh, or hormones, you can actually upregulate the production of bradykinin, and this has been shown now to be through heat shock proteins. So, this hasn't been studied, but stress reduction, I think, is a good thing. If anybody knows how to have a stress-free life, um, meet, meet me afterwards, because I could use some time. <laughs> what about long-term prophylaxis? So, we have options for long-term prophylaxis. This is the androgen data showing, as, as Dr. Altman said, these do work for most people. The problem with androgens, of course, is that in this study by Bork, nearly half of the patients stopped their androgens over the, the study period, mostly due to adverse effects. And I'm not going to go to all the effects of androgens, but realize these do have side effects that we really got to counsel patients about and monitor closely if they choose to use androgens for, for prevention. This is the IVC1 inhibitor data that, that Art alluded to earlier, and you can see uh, this is going back several years now, but there was this 50% reduction in attacks on a mean rate, uh, giving 1,000 units uh, twice weekly. Uh, what he was referring to, of course, are these people. This person got worse, this person got worse, had more attacks, this person stayed about the same. Um, I can tell you, this person right here that got considerably worse was a woman. She wasn't at our study site, but I know the investigator very well, and after the study results were all published, we talked about this. That was a woman who had, during the course of the study, from shifting from placebo to the treatment arm, lost her job, was going through a divorce, had financial problems, had lots of socioeconomic issues going on that he believes um, caused her attack rate to really skyrocket, despite the fact that she was um, on treatment during the second half of the study. So uh, I don't know if that's the explanation, but again, in clinical trials, there's all this stuff you can't, you know, you can't control for, and may have a may have an impact. What we do know now, though, this is a dose escalation study led by John Bernstein and a few others. 
showing that in these people that didn't respond very well, if you increase their dose, 1,500, 2,000, even up to 2,500 units IV twice a week, you can get this response, the preventative response in nearly all of them. So not surprisingly, the single dose or the, the 1,000 units wasn't enough in some of the patients and they had to individualize the dose. And this is actually in the labeling now for the IVC1 inhibitor product that we're allowed to dose escalate uh, based on the FDA approval. This is the sub-QC1 inhibitor study. Um, so again, given twice a week, but now subcutaneously approved at the 60 units per kilo. And you can see these very dramatic reductions in attack rates uh, on median analysis, 95% reduction. So this represents a, a more effective way uh, to prevent attacks and is easier for patients because it's sub-Q versus IV. Um, this study also showed us that you, you can uh, sort of have a target dose here in the approved dose 48% of functional C1 inhibitor levels on, on mean, um, and that that uh, significantly reduced the risk of an attack. It wasn't perfect, but you can see some of these patients had even higher levels where you saw almost no attacks occurring. And we are seeing people attack free on this treatment. They just stop having uh, episodes once they're on therapy. And then the newest uh, preventative therapy, lanadelumab, monoclonal antibody against plasma calocrine, sub-Q treatment given every two weeks uh, to start with. Uh, you can't see, but the approved dose to start with is 300 milligrams every uh, two weeks. And again, compared to placebo, these very dramatic reductions, 87% mean reduction in attack rate. Uh, the labeling for this drug does allow us after six months to reduce the dose uh, to 300 milligrams every four weeks because that was also proven effective compared to placebo. Um, so that's, that's something we'll have to see how people do, but over time, we may be able to, to dose this less frequently than the every two weeks. Um, Are you getting that yeah. drug approved? What's that? Are you getting that drug approved by insurance out of San Diego? It's been mixed. Um, I think like any new medicine, it's, there are some delays and we've had some denials, um, but we have had some that have gone through um, pretty quickly. Yeah. You, when you decrease the function of, of calocrine, does that have any other adverse weird effects that you see with that? So uh, the, the short-term safety, and by short-term, I mean we have about uh, a little over a year's worth of data right now, and it seems to be, a, there don't seem to be any red flags. Um, the, the biggest cons theoretical concern, I think, has been clotting, um, whether there would be thromboembolic events. There has not been any of those to this point, um, and there's been about uh, 200 patients that have been on therapy um, for, again, roughly a year, give or take. Um, so, so far, so good. I, I think your point is a good one, that we don't have long-term data with this approach. The only reassuring thing I would say is that when you look at calocrine function, and they have that was actually presented at the meeting now, at the college meeting, the calocrine function actually, um, it doesn't even get down to quite normal. It's still just above the normal range that you and I are, if you don't have HAE, are walking around with. So it's not that it completely eliminates calocrine function. It just brings it down to closer to what we would expect it normally to be. And so it's not, it's not the total absence of of plasma calocrine activity. But we but we we do need long-term data. I mean, I think that's something we're all going to be watching closely to make sure that there isn't some unexpected issue. All right, I'm going to skip this. This is in your um, slides. Um, and, and the decision to use long-term prophylaxis, I always say, is more art than science. There's no formula. None of the guidelines have come out with, you know, you need X number of attacks to go on long-term prophylaxis. So, if you hear that from insurance companies, um, they're making that up. There, there's no data to show, uh, you know, you need 10 attacks a year to go on long-term prophylaxis. They're pulling that out of the air. This is something that really, I believe, should be, to be between you and the patient deciding whether people want to be on prophylaxis or just treat their attacks as they arise. All right, so you want a longer life with less quality or vice versa. Well, we, we want it all. Let me very quickly, I know I'm almost out of time, let me show you what's coming down the pike. Um, we have um, an oral preventative agent that blocks calocrine. We have another monoclonal against factor 12 in development. There is a company using antisense therapy to block uh, uh, RNA and transcription of either factor 12 or plasma calocrine. And there's been some foray into gene therapy, although there have been some delays to that. Uh, this is just the recombinant C1 inhibitor is only approved for acute treatment. 
Um, but we did do a study a couple years ago to show it does work for prophylactic treatment. The FDA has not approved it for that. But when there were plasma um, drug shortages, this was a very useful data to have because it, it did allow us to get recombinant drug for people that otherwise went without therapy uh, for prevention. Um, so let me show you just quickly the new drugs. We don't know if these work or if they're safe. These are all investigational. The oral calocrine inhibitor, um, this is given, it's a pill given once daily, uh, and it did show in a phase two that you saw these significant reductions on the order of 60 to 90 percent, depending on what types of attacks you looked at. Uh, the, one of the limitations with this drug has been at higher doses, we saw a lot of GI side effects. So the phase three that's going on is looking at the middle doses here, where it seems to, to work to prevent attacks, but you don't see upset stomach, uh, diarrhea, the things that were happening at, uh, at high doses of the medication. This compound is also being looked at as an oral acute therapy. So they've gotten now a, a preparation that has a very rapid bioavailability. I, I've sort of been making the joke, instead of doing a shot to treat your attacks, you can do a shot to treat your attacks. Um, so we may have a way to treat uh, attacks oral with the oral medication. Uh, this is antisense therapy, so targeting the expression of pre or factor 12. There have been animal models showing this can be very effective, but has not been moved uh, into pivotal human studies yet. These are just uh, mice and monkeys where you can knock down factor 12 very effectively with sub-Q uh, antisense molecules. And then let me say real quickly uh, 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 about uh, AAV therapy, so gene therapy. Just this summer, there was a paper published, again, in a mouse model, C1 inhibitor deficiency mice. If you just give them the viral vector, you don't see anything, but if you put the C1 inhibitor gene in that vector, you get this um, very robust expression of C1 inhibitor protein that with a single treatment lasted for at least six months um, and normalized their protein levels. So we were all very excited about this, and there's a company that it, it was gonna move this into human trials just a few weeks ago, they made it public that this same viral vector that they've been using in their alpha-1 gene therapy um, protocols uh, did not give very good expression in humans. So again, you all know mice are not humans, and what worked really well here has not panned out as well in the human studies. So they're back to the drawing board in terms of selecting a vector, and I think that's going to delay any human studies we see. But in theory, uh, we could correct this uh, problem with gene therapy. And this is just gene editing. I'm not aware of anybody doing gene editing yet, but one could envision if you could um, repair uh, these certain cassettes where we see lots of mutations, you could develop a series of gene editing techniques that would cure a subset of people uh, with those mutations. Um, so uh, I'll wrap up there. I think what we're seeing by and large is a, a clinically is a shift to preventative therapy, given that we've gotten more effective and better tolerated preventative treatments. I like this cartoon because I, I think predictability is the buzzword. I think that's what we're, uh, we're aiming for, to make life more predictable for these patients with, with a very bad, unpredictable disease. Um, and I think we're getting closer to doing that. So um, uh, just a reminder, if I can help you guys in any way, send me an email, give me a call. That's why we're down there in San Diego is to try to assist with managing some of these patients. Um, and I'll thank you and uh, take any last questions there might be. One question I always have when I'm talking to people is that we were all taught this is a one in 50,000. Yeah. I don't know if it's because we specialize in this, but I get the impression that it's more common. Than oh, there. If you look at the, so if you look at type 1 and type 2, um, most of the decent epi studies that have been done, you come in around 1 in 60 to 1 in 70,000. So I, I do think the true prevalence of C1 inhibitor deficiency is probably in that ballpark. It may be a little more common because it's underdiagnosed. But I, to your point, what I see, I think there's actually um, a fair number of people out there that swell, uh, that don't have a histamine problem, and that don't have C1 inhibitor deficiency. And so I, I think, it's that, but it's, it may be bradykinin. So I think the overall population of bradykinin mediated angioedema is probably considerably larger than we used to think. Um, and it's only because we have treatments for the type 1 and type 2 that now we're seeing all these other people that say, hey, I, I have that, those symptoms also, uh, but, but they don't have the, the, um, the C1 inhibitor deficiency. 
Um, but no one knows how common HAE with normal C1 inhibitor is. We just don't have good numbers because we don't have a good way to define it very well right now. Are there, is there some dysregulation of the microRNAs? Is there just a few that are handling these calocrine pathways? Could that be another area it, it, of dysfunction? It, it, it could very well could be. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not aware anybody's looked at that um, carefully, but yeah, I think, um, I think there are probably other uh, mechanisms or other things at play here that we haven't identified yet. And, and to your point that, that, you know, mostly what's been done so far is um, uh, genetic screens looking at sort of the candidate, you know, whether it's the bradykinin receptor or the various proteins in the contact system looking for um, uh, polymorphisms or mutations in, this, in the pathway that would sort of explain why some people may have um, dysregulation issues. Those have been pretty disappointing, honestly, the sort of targeted gene panels that have been done by different groups. So it's the old, you know, we're, we're looking under the street lamp where we know where to look. And I think you're probably right. We need to start looking at some of these other things. But I don't think we're, we're that far along in that investigation. Yeah. I've had um, one patient with really severe scrotal edema is, is recurrent. Manifestation. Are there some sites that are get your attention more with regard to a mechanism or a different? I mean, is rhyme or reason for what you where you just see the angioedema in one area? Yeah, not not that we know of. The, the only thing I would say is that the um, at least classically the factor twelve, the plasminogen, which again we're not even testing for yet, um, those tend to affect the tongue and the the upper airway in the face much more often than they do the GI tract. Um, so there are some, some nuances in terms of the different subtypes that we talked about, but uh, you know, if you just talk about type one or type two, no, I don't know of any, I don't think that gives us any real clues um, about you know, what's causing it or what type it is. I'm expecting to be shot down with this question, so feel free. <laughs> it's, it refers to the abdominal pain problems. I over 20 years, I've had some frequent flyers that have abdominal pains over and over again. I've seen hundreds of them. And I'm convinced that some of it is narcotic bowel, and mm -hmm. that narcotic bowel continues. And trying to separate out the HAE from these other factors have been, have been really difficult. Uh, um, the best answer I got once was from Michael Frank, who suggested that I overtreat, get the complement levels normal get a CAT scan showing there's nothing in the abdomen, and then telling the patient, we have proof it's not HAE. Yeah. And uh, I've, you've given me an answer to the CAT scan, you can't rely on. Bruce Zero said you can. I have no idea. Uh, but do you have any other suggestions how to separate the non-HAE stomach pain from yeah. the so a couple, HAE stomach pain? Yeah, so a couple pain? things. I, I think the abdominal pain, the frequent abdominal painters are problematic. Um, the, the, you know, imaging, we do imaging all the time too. My point with that is that no one's ever established the sensitivity of a CT scan or an ultrasound to diagnose intestinal angioedema. It's sort of, if you see it, great. That, that you have a positive test is very helpful. A negative test, again, I don't think we know. I've actually seen a few patients, this was long ago, when you could see these people coming to the hospital and we had nothing we could do for them, clearly had HAE attacks, um, clearly responded to things like FFP or other, but but the scan was totally normal. And so I, 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 I do scans, but I don't think you can always say, well, if you don't have scan findings, you can't possibly have an HAE attack. I, I don't know that that's right. Um, the second thing is that uh, my experience now with the newer treatments has been that it's much easier to sort of exclude the attack and move on to other things. And so with the acute treatments, um, you know, if people use them early, they are so very effective that if, it, if the abdominal pain doesn't respond to these acute treatments, you got to think of something else. And I tell patients that, listen, if, if your abdominal pain doesn't respond to these medicines, you got to go get checked out because you could have an appendix or a gallbladder or something else. Um, and the last thing I would say is with the new preventative treatments, again, I think this is a real opportunity to sort out what's HAE and what isn't because, again, these drugs are so effective. I had a patient a month ago that was on the sub-QC1 inhibitor, came in with the same story. I'm having abdominal pain almost every week, and it's really terrible, and I'm going to the hospital, and I'm getting pain medicine, and I said, this doesn't make sense. You're on sub-QC1 inhibitor. 
you shouldn't be having these attacks. We measured her level, which is one that you can do that with the sub Q, the monoclonal, you know, we have to sort out how we know if it's working, but her level was 90%. It was n totally normal. And I said, you shouldn't be having attacks. It's just, it, I can't explain it. So I sent her to the GI doc. She had ulcerative colitis. <laughs> I mean, and this is where I think we may be missing things, you know, or the, somebody's missing things that we're sort of... After, after two or three visits to the GI, you can search. Yeah, but... You know, one but lady we, had daytime bladder, and no, everyone missed it. Her well, KE went away with... Good and, and I've seen pancreatitis. I've seen um, uh, gastroparesis cause problems in, in a couple patients. So and my point is that as the treatments get better and better, I think we can say with more and more confidence if we're, you know, in these patients, there's something else going on because you really shouldn't be having these frequent attacks. And uh, I think it's rare, but there are patients that because of the past of, uh, you know, opioid dependence or they seek out opioids. I, I've seen that a couple times. I don't prescribe opioids at all anymore for HAE. That, those days are gone. Um, we have good medicines. There's other ways to go about it. So. I think I don't think that happens often, but I think you know we have to be conscious that that was the past, and there were issues in the past with that. Thank you. Do the histaminergic uh, episodes of angiodema respond at all to the bradykine and related drugs? Not that we know of. Um, I, I think that's a pretty you know we we kind of push on the histamine pathway first, and if we're striking out, then sometimes we'll try you know if everything's normal, we'll try to get a bradykine and targeted treatment because we think. At least, for instance, Icatabant um, or Acalantide, which are very specific inhibitors, should be very specific to that, those types of swelling. There's um, the only crosstalk I know of, there is some in the, in the um, venom literature, venom anaphylaxis literature, there's some evidence that if you get massive mast cell activation, that you can actually measure bradykinin going up a little bit. And this has been one of the theories of, you know, refractory anaphylaxis that, you're treating histamine, but you're not covering bradykinin. But I don't know of any studies showing that those drugs work for you know other the usual histamine-mediated problems. Well, Mark, thanks. That yeah. was just brilliant. All right, thank you guys. But, uh, and I, well, when I'm talking about this, I, it's an example of how basic science has dramatically changed the debate from yeah, the mystery right. to something that's essentially curable. It is. Yeah. So we're, we're real close, close to being there. Right. Right. Hey, hey, sorry, good to see you. Please Please to to no one come. Right. Sorry, that stuck in traffic. That's all right. 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 Yeah, I don't think there's none of the other things I mentioned are you can't get it. Okay. Okay. Well, so okay. that's, that's one of our tools next year. I don't know that it'll improve our assay. I'll take this up top. You can take whatever you want from me. I'll take that. Yeah, we'll 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 take it's still a problem, and I, I think we don't have the website. I don't know what our final revised guidelines are going to look like, but, but we're trying to tackle this because it is. It's just that it's a good thing. Yeah, all right. So we can only say the data samples, but we actually recommend having a section on the HRE.